Hello, powerful people, and welcome back to the Power at Work blog. I'm Seth Harris, a senior fellow at the Burns Center for Social Change, and this is the Power Hour. Uh, we invite nationally renowned labor experts to talk about some of the biggest labor topics of the day. The panelists and I choose the topics together so we get some diversity in the approach and diversity of perspective. Uh, today, we've got two of the very best in the world of labor uh, joining us from opposite ends of the country, from entirely different time zones, even. Uh, and I think of both of them not just as great scholars, but also as great activists. They combine that role of public intellectual and activist, uh, I think, very, very effectively. Uh, Victor Naro has been involved with immigrant rights and labor issues for four decades. Uh, he's a project director for the UCLA Labor Center and a core faculty member at the UCLA Department of Labor Studies. He's also core faculty at the Pub Public Interest Law Program at UCLA School of Law. His latest book, is the activist spirit toward a radical solidarity, which is published by a small union publisher. Good for you, Victor, for giving business to Hardball Press. Folks do business with Hardball Press. They're a unionized publisher. We love that. David Madeline is a senior fellow and the senior advisor to the American Worker Project at our friends at the Center for American a progress and and one of the David I think is one of the most important voices in Washington around uh, labor issues. His most recent book is Reunion or Reunion, I think is how that's pronounced. Reunion: How Bold Labor Reforms Can Repair, Revitalize, and Reunite the United States. Published by Cornell University Press. There's a little drinking game out there. Every time I mention Cornell, people are supposed to take a shot because uh, that's my alma mater. Gentlemen, thank you so much for participating in the Power Hour today. Thanks, so Thanks nice very much for having us. Thank you. Oh, it's great. It's, it's, I, I can't thank you enough. It's going to be, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to a great conversation and thanks for the great work that you do. Okay, so let's go to topic number one. Uh, let, me, let me say, you, you all are observing this as closely as I am. By any reasonable measure, there are a lot of strikes and a lot of strikers right now. Um, and let me just say there is recent news about three big strikes that are going on right now. Let me just give that news. First, the UAW expanded its strike against Ford yesterday. They expanded it to Ford's most profitable, most lucrative plant. It's a truck plant uh, in Kentucky. 8,700 more workers went out on strike. Um, so for those who have been telling me, oh, it looks like uh, the UAW strike is coming to a close. No, not yet. It looks like there's a few more weeks to go, at least a couple more weeks to go, maybe a little bit more. A second, the negotiations uh, between SAG-AFTRA and the Hollywood Studios broke down last night as the Studios Trade Association, the Alliance for Motion Picture and Television Producers, just walked away from the table. They said they were making no progress and they walked away from the bargaining table. And then third, it is now appearing increasingly likely that the coalition of Kaiser Permanente unions is going to, after a very successful three-day strike, have another probably longer strike, likely in November. I don't know if they've announced the dates there. I may have missed it. So lots of strike activity, lots of big strikes, very large strikes continuing. Uh, so here are my questions for, for you, uh, Victor, and you, David. How do you explain the explosion in strike activity that we're seeing right now? David, let me, let me start with you. Thanks. Um, I, I think of this as um, both sort of a short run phenomenon and a long run phenomenon. So the long run phenomenon is that we've had decades of stagnant wages, uh, you know, near record profits, CEOs doing well, workers not doing that well. And at the same time, so that's this long run trend. The short run trend is, you know, just coming out of COVID where workers were called essential, but they saw that they were treated really poorly. And so I think there's sort of their frustration has bubbled over and they are now taking more action than they have in quite some time. You know, this this year is uh, expected to be on track to be as many strikes far more than they had last year, which was 50 percent more than the year before. Um, so we're 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 this combination of short and, and long run that uh, I think has 
it's also the other thing that's going on is to capture the, the imagination of the of politicians and the public because that has is very different. The public now is more supportive of unions than they've been in many, many decades. You've got about 70% support for unions. And you have, of course, President Biden and a, a number of politicians now actually vying to be sort of who can be more pro-union. And that leads to a lot more press coverage. So I think you have, uh, you know, these big trends, but also just, it's just politics and attention that, that, that's causing a, a lot more focus on the issues right now. Well, so, Victor, I want to ask you if you agree with David, but I also want to ask you this, because David's suggesting there's a short term phenomenon here, but there's also a longer term underlying maybe structural change. Do you agree with that? And do you think that this very, very high level of strike activity, the highest level in a generation, really you have to go back to the turn of the century to see this level of strike activity. Um, do you think it's going to continue or if the labor market gets a little slacker, are we going to see a decline again in the amount of strike activity that we're seeing? I think it's going to continue, um, Seth. And here's the reason. I, you know, the, uh, according to the Economic Policy Institute, we, we have 70% fewer strikes than in the 1970s. The 60s and the 70s were the moment in the, uh, in the labor movement's history where we saw major strikes. So then, as we know, what the Reagan administration did to organize labor, uh, you know, with the air traffic controller strike, and also the parts of the deregulation, the, that, that decade of the 80s, really, uh, the conservatives in this country, the corporate America worked tirelessly to destroy the labor movement. And I think we, you know, in the 1990s, uh, with the demographic changes in many unions of immigrant workers, uh, really, uh, comprising a majority of the workforce in the service sector and organized labor, really trying to organize these workers, justice for janitors and the major strike in 2000 here in Los Angeles, a major example. That started shifting and we started seeing more militant organizing, more uh, worker uh, engagement and actions. I think uh, I agree with David, the pandemic, we took stock of our lives. You know, it was life and death. It was a, a crisis for all of us. We all lost friends and relatives. Um, I work with a lot of great worker leaders or essential workers. And it, literally every time I turn my email on, I got bad news about a garment worker, a grocery worker, an agricultural worker who I came to know through my work. And um, I think we took stock of what's important. And workers real, started to realize the pandemic exposed a deep inequality in this country, especially when you deal with wages and um, the crisis of being able to afford housing, a quality of life. And I think workers are fed up and they're fighting for what they feel is owed to them. And I agree with David that income inequality, uh, the stagnation of wages the past uh, 30 years, with the decline in the labor un movement, dens union density, it's a recipe for workers who are, you know, today the majority of workers are struggling to make ends meet day to day living. And, I think workers are finally fed up and doing something. And it's not just unions, the, you know, workers engaging in strikes, but all kinds of activities. We see all this alt labor movement happening, you know, 5 for 15, which, you know, David worked on that led to this great uh, victory in California that we'll probably be talking about. But also uh, workers engage in all kinds of activities, even uh, gig workers, like Rice Share Drivers United and other uh, you know, gig workers coming together, independent contractors, gig workers being misclassified are still fighting for better conditions. And so I think this is going to continue. And I think it's it's something that's overdue for a long time. So I want to let me let me express a concern and get your assessment of whether this is a well-placed concern or not. As you look at the strikes that are going on right now, there are two characteristics of the unions that are going out on strike. One is often they are skilled workers, or let me just say, I don't like the I don't like to talk about skilled versus unskilled because I think every worker has skills and brings skills to their jobs. So, but there are workers who have uh, experience, knowledge, and training that creates a barrier to entry for other workers into their jobs. So you can't just pick up a pen and become a writer in Hollywood. You can't just show up and become 
George Clooney, an actor in Hollywood. Not that he's the typical actor in Hollywood, of course. Uh, you can't um, you can't just all of a sudden uh, become a healthcare worker, right? You, you have to you have to learn things. You have to know things. You have to be trained. So there are barriers. The unions that are out on strike either are unions of those kinds of workers or they're mass unions where the union is taking out tens of thousands. In the case of the Teamsters, hundreds of thousands, 340,000 workers in the UPS Teamsters unit, the largest private sector unit. And, and it would have been impossible, absolutely impossible for UPS to replace those 340,000 workers. So it's either experiential and skills based barriers or just mass size that makes it very difficult for employers to respond to a strike by replacing the workers. There are other unions, the Starbucks Union Workers United, which has organized 350 of their shops, but has not been able to get a contract and has not called a strike. There's the Amazon Labor Union, the Trader Joe's Union, which are independent, and they have only a few facilities. Those workers maybe are a little bit more replaceable, and those unions have not been able to strike. They've engaged in some other collective actions. There have been spot strikes by Workers United. So are we now in a place where that's the divide? It's the workers who can bring really meaningful barriers to being replaced to the table versus those workers who just are at the labor market's whim and therefore don't have very much power in their dealings with their employers. What do you think, David? I think you're hitting on a, a, a real sore spot and a concern for sort of how the economy functions and for which workers have power in it. The, in fact, the sort of interesting research that uh, shows over time that labor unions, um, when they are stronger, when they represent more people, they're more able to represent those with less labor market power, for example, those without a college degree. But as the law and as, you know, policy has shifted to make it very hard for workers to form unions, unions are more likely to represent those with some extra labor market skills because they had some power that enabled them to form the union in the first place. So even though unions might be needed the most in areas like fast food or or other places, the, the, the workers that have them have a little bit more labor market power. And so that's, you know, that's a challenge now to the labor movement and to sort of American society of how we ensure that kind of all workers can have the benefits of the, the, the labor movement can, can bring. And, and this is where it sort of gets to your prior question of, is this going to last? Is this renewed labor activism going to really lead to something new and different? And uh, I'm perhaps a little bit more pessimistic than than Victor, I do think the the underlying trends are good. the workers are going to be in the streets and and they've got the demand and they're fed up. But at some point, I think it has to also lead to results, and in order for it to continue, and the results can come from just their their collective power, but it also can come from policymakers shifting the the power even more in their direction. And we've got some of that, as you know, from President Biden, um, but it might not be enough yet. We might need more. Victor, I, because you've spent so much time advocating for and working with immigrant workers who often find themselves, at least in the first instance, in the kind of jobs where employers think they can be easily replaced and therefore they don't have much bargaining power. Tell me if you agree with this, my vision or my, not my vision, that's not what I would like the world to be, but my assessment of where, what, what's happening in strike activity, that the, those workers who have barriers have real power. Those workers who maybe don't have those barriers, not able to strike, not able to bring the, their employers to the bargaining table, not able to get the really good quality contracts because they just don't have the requisite level of power. Well, I agree with the comments you both have made so far and the concerns. You know, the, the, this economy, as you know, is divided with different industries, different arrangements, regulated versus unregulated. Um, and then you have labor law, you know, all, you know, the right to organize is uh, covered by a legal regime that comes from the 1930s, almost 100 years old. And, you know, I think we need to have like reforms in place, either policy or labor law reform. I know we've been talking about it. Uh, you know, Congress is just not there at the 
you know, the congressional landscape is not there for us to be able to do that. But state by state, we're looking at that. You know, California has been leading the efforts to uh, create, um, you know, as much collective power as possible for workers, union and non-union workers to policy um, changes. And also, you know, cities like Los Angeles has been trying to figure this out to, uh, to create power for workers in general. But, uh, you know, organizing... I think that the moment of truth right now for organized labor is, you know, do we continue this path of, you know, really organizing strategies, social justice activism, you know, the, the, like social justice unionism, what goes beyond just what's on the table and collective bargaining, but also deal with issues of housing, uh, climate change, um, issues that impact us every day in everyday lives, uh, you know. The bargaining for the common good, like you know, in the fight for workers, do we also extend a solidarity to other workers so that you know it, it, this this is what's unique about Los Angeles? We've had all these strikes, but you in a picket line, you you have the hotel workers have been on strike, most the immigrant workers going against these mega corporations, the tourism industry and the hotel industry, but at the picket line for the hotel workers, you have writers. You have SAG after you have UAW members joining the workers, and then these uh workers uh hotel workers go to the picket lines of the writers guild and the picket lines of SAG after I think it's you know solidarity it's uh we it, we developing a core level of solidarity that I think is gonna be very helpful so that we will then once you win your contract then you go out there and you fight for the Starbucks workers who are being you know, uh, you talk about uh, employer re retaliation, uh, flagrant violations of the NLRB. Then you fight for the Starbucks workers. We all then come behind them. I just think that's where we are going to be able to uh, counter some of these challenges. Yeah, solidarity is the solution to worker power. I like that a lot. But both of you have mentioned public policy as a possible mechanism for building worker power. So that takes us to topic number two. And David, you're going to lead on this one, California fast food workers, a higher minimum wage and sectoral bargaining. Let me turn it over to you. So yes, in, in California, there's been a big, big policy shift that I think is really important that so fast food workers you think of as sort of the typical like we even denigrate the work as a mick job it's not real work it's sort of seen as the lowest tier um and yet these workers through lots of powerful organizing came together and they pushed their politicians to change and create a system that is going to be akin to it's not directly sectoral bargaining but it's akin to and this is the idea that you can bargain across an entire sector of the economy to raise standards. And they are going to do that through what's called this fast food council, where you have representatives of workers, representatives of employers, and representatives of the public setting minimum standards. And they're going to instantly go to $20 an hour. So that's a big shift. And then hopefully throughout time, they'll continue to raise those standards, the, the, the wage standards, but also think about adding safety and other kinds of improvements. And the reason this kind of standard setting, I think, is so important is, first, in certain industries, the traditional worksite by worksite bargaining has been very, very difficult, if not impossible, to organize at fast food workers. You think if you organized a, tip, a franchise, uh, one, one competitor is going to have higher costs than their neighbor across the street. They might not be able to compete. They also have very little ability to change their business practices because they're part of a franchise model where they can't raise the prices on the food. They have to buy from certain suppliers, so they can't really structure it. And so raising wages needs to be done across the board so that everyone is on a level playing field. And more and more uh, more and more industries in our economy are akin to this sort of fissured structure where the small employers that you might traditionally bargain site, work site by work site, don't really have the power to raise wages. And so I think this is a really key step towards how we improve standards for all workers in the future. So Victor, you're in LA, uh, so you're seeing this up close. Um, what's your sense of this new, uh, let me just say, the, the, what what David is describing is brand new. At least the twenty dollar minimum wage has only happened in the last few weeks. So, what's your sense of it, Victor? Is this going to be a successful way of 
taking fast food jobs that have been low wage, no benefits, no union, high turnover, and turning them into the kinds of jobs that can support a family or at least create a pathway to a middle class job. Yeah. So there's a lot of debate about sectoral bargaining. You know, it's used in a lot of different like European countries, a debate about does it really lead to worker power? Does it lead to collective power of the workers? Do workers continue to have that voice uh, in the workplace or does it fall into the hands of that unit that creates the standards? But I think it's a good thing that we're, what this legislation does. I, one thing I'm optimistic about it, it has a timeline. So it will cause us to revisit it. You know, it's a window period so that the $20 an hour, because I, I think like in Los Angeles right now, you need to be making like $36 an hour just to have a affordable quality housing. And so I think it, it's a path forward. I mean, I think these workers, uh, all non-union workers will have uh, a base of $20 an hour. And I think in a few years, we get to revisit this policy. But in the future, we, will, we may need to bring it up more to $30 an hour. So that's one of the reasons why I like this legislation. It creates a standard, but it allows us to revisit it. It doesn't lock us into that $20 an hour indefinitely. So we can go back and make changes to it. Uh, I think this process works best uh, when you do have worker collective power that's happening at the same time. And I think this was, this was successful because 5 for 15, it's been a campaign that's not recent. It's been going on for a long time with heavy investment from SEIU. And there was a lot of community uh, base building, a lot of alliance building to support these workers. I think that led to uh, this legislation. And I think it's an example of how worker power can lead to something that resembles sectoral, sectoral bar, you know, bargaining, like a sectoral, sectoral labor standards. Um, but then we just have to keep investing in 5 for 15 because I think it doesn't just stop at $20 an hour. You know, retaliation is a big deal. Like workers get fired before just even speaking up about the uh, working conditions. So, you know, workers still need to fight for other rights but at least they have a standard now, a labor standard of $20 an hour. In Los Angeles, we're now fighting for $30 an hour for tourism workers. So it goes beyond, above what even unionized workers are making in many hotels because we're, we're always trying to figure out how to use this kind of process to lift up standards for all workers with the hope that non-union employers can eventually one day become unionized. But I think this is a great law, and I'm looking forward to continue supporting fight for 15 because I think now that they have $20 an hour, let's go fight for all the rights that they have that they are entitled to. And I think Victor is hitting on something really important about these kinds of policies, these sectoral standard setting that it's, you know, it can be denigrated as kind of a top down approach. And at some levels it is, there's some top down elements to it, but the top down is really key for for setting broad standards, covering all sorts of workers who wouldn't normally be protected by a union, but it also is complementary and only works when there is sort of the bottom up pressure and and that the this and it does that in a couple of ways. So first, you're not going to get the higher standards without the workers really being engaged and involved. The companies aren't going to just say we're voluntarily going to agree to this. We just want to do it. They they'll need to be pressured. The policy also, uh, you know, this sectoral standard setting creates mechanisms to involve the workers. They get to, you know, be perhaps be on the board themselves. They have hearings. There's things that involve them. And, and so I think it's this, the, the ultimate goal is this complementary between the worksite organizing and the broader standard setting. And ultimately, I think that's what we need because we're in a situation, you know, just I think everyone knows this, but. 6% of the private sector is unionized, say just 6%. That is lower than before the law, the National Labor Relations Act was passed. That means it's very, very hard for most any worker to get the benefits of unions. And we need to dramatically ramp up the workers that benefit from union coverage, as well as create pathways for them to organize, to uh, be involved in the process. And it's gonna need, it's a both and. It's not like you only have bottom up the strikes and you, or you only have the policy, it's, you need both. So I, 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 I want to ask two very big questions, but I don't, I'm going to ask you to give your answers 
fairly quickly just because I want to get on. I know we have a couple more topics we want to get to, but I acknowledge these are gigantic questions and, and maybe we all need to write papers about this. So the first question is, is the goal here to build a stepping stone toward what Victor is describing, which is ultimately unionization or so, some other form of worker collective power on top of the government's intervention through this participatory process? Is that the goal or is this the process that we want to have in place and keep in place and it, you know, we don't need worker collective power other than in the way that you're describing, David. And then the second very, very gigantic question is, are we going to see this expand beyond the fast food sector? Now, there have been earlier examples. New York had a process, I think, around green grocers. Um, are, is, is this a model that we think is replicable and scalable beyond California and in other industries? So jump into either one of those in either so, way that you want. David, why don't you start and then I'll Victor? Start, sure. So yes, it's it's clearly scalable. It clearly applies to other industries. We have now about uh, six states and three cities that passed similar laws for other industries just in the past five years. We have Colorado, uh, Michigan. We have uh, Minnesota, uh, for example, and they the they pass laws that deal with home care or agriculture. So clearly you can apply to lots of industries. The other thing, and this, this that's happening around this set of policies, and this gets to your other question, but so New Zealand just passed a major policy akin to this. So did Australia. And their models are much more of the both and we're going to have real, we're going to have this broad high level thing, but we're really going to build union power into the system. That's ultimately what they're they're achieving. And New Zealand is a really core model that what we have in the United States and we're trying to do is something that is legally acceptable under the National Labor Relations Act. That is the Supreme Court has said state preempts lots of state activity. So we have a version that is minimum standard setting that is not directly about unions. It's about involving workers in a participatory process, but it is. Um, legally allowed and there's a long you know hundreds of years states have been doing doing this thing is it what we would what ultimately pass at the federal level if we were to do something like this no i don't think so but it's le legally what we can do now and it's a good stepping stone uh that other states can follow victor what do you think are we going to yeah, see this in more you know, industries um, in the united states i i agree with david i think the fact that 94 percent of private sector workers are the unionized we have to come up with these kind of policies. I think policies uh, create the space for organizing, um, but policies have a, a, you know, they also have a timeline of when they, they become ineffective. I mean, I think lab good labor policies need to be revisited every 10 years. I, I just worked on a campaign recently to uh, work on legislation that I worked on back in 1999 with uh, a, a whole bunch of worker advocates on the garment industry. We put a joint liability provisions, a process for workers to you know, eliminate wage step in the industry in 1999. 20 years later, we had to go back and change that law and make changes to it and give it the peace rate system. And because it, it's, you know, w policies have a definite timeline when they lose their effectiveness. But we have to create these policies because when you have 94% of the private sector are not unionized, we have a crisis. And this is why we have wage stagnation, uh, the crisis of wage inequality in this country because the union density is so low. But we have to create these kind of policies and continue the organizing. And as you increase union density, that these policies then become a vehicle for something different. But I think this what we have now we have we do the best we can and in California we had the union uh, you know the uh, uh, California labor movements very influential to help work and community organization we work together to create this kind of policy and now we can replicate it in other states because I I don't see anything happen in the federal level because it's Congress is just a polarizing toxic place right now for even to get like labor law reform but i don't i I, think, I don't know I why you say that in california I, we try I to duplicate what, it in other what, states 
Yeah. I don't know why you say Congress is toxic and difficult. I mean, they have no Speaker of the House. There doesn't seem to be any hope of getting a Speaker of the House. And it's an even vote, essentially, in the United States Senate. So um, I, maybe you're right now that I think about it. Maybe you're right. OK, let's go on to topic number three. And um, Victor, there are certain things that you can absolutely count on in American life. Uh, you know, the sun is going to come up in the east. It's going to set in the west. We're all going to have to pay taxes unless we're billion dollar corporations. And immigration is going to be one of the leading issues debated in our politics. And, and fortunately for us, you're one of the nation's leading experts on immigration, particularly the intersection of immigration and worker rights. So where do you think we are on the relationship between organizing, organized labor, uh, worker power and immigration in our country right now, particularly given the ongoing flow of working age people from Central America and Mexico into the United States? Well, as we know, since 2000, the AFL-CIO in 2000 really shifted their position on immigration and immigrant workers. I mean, they came out for comprehensive immigration reform and then to these employer sanction policies that really became detrimental to them. They used to support those kind of policies. Now, in 2000, they started to shift away from those policies. And then also civil rights and protection for immigrant workers, labor protection for workers. And um, since then, I, I mean, the, the connection between the labor movement and immigrant rights movement have been very closely connected since then. The reality is uh, many of, you know, the industries where unions are focused on the majority of the workforce are immigrants, and many of them are undocumented immigrants, which is why we have to continue to fight for some kind of legalization program. But we're doing the best we can now. As you know, this is not going to happen in Congress. The debate on immigration is just a toxic debate in Congress. But the President Biden has been doing some great stuff that that's unions have been supporting. One example is the Department of Homeland Security uh, issued a directive for deferred action for undocumented workers who suffer any kind of labor violations can work through uh, either the labor department, uh, Department of Labor, or the state enforcement, labor enforcement agency. They can work with those enforcement agencies to get deferred action for those workers, which means deferred action is not legalization. It's not permanent legal status, but it gives them right now they can get two years of work authorization, two years of, uh, you know, legal status to a work authorization while, you know, they are here in this country. So they get some kind of legal status for uh, a temporary period of time. But so now uh, unions that have immigrant workers as their base are doing workshops, trying to figure out ways to help as an applies to organizing workers use this new policy. So so we're, we're trying to figure out how we can support undocumented workers because a lot of these campaigns that unions have, very, have been very successful with, from the janitors to hotel workers to uh, other kinds of uh, you know campaigns where you have immigrant workers as the the core of the organizing base. Um, a lot of these campaigns have been led by undocumented workers, and so the labor movement is now seeing this workforce is very instrumental to its future. Like the more we can invest in uh, issues of immigration reform, the lives of these immigrant workers, the more that we can uh, have really that kind of a workforce that can lead to what I hope will be an increase in union density in this country. Yeah. So, I, David, I want to turn this question for you a little bit political, if you don't mind my my doing that. Um, this is uh, one of the leading issues among white working class voters in the United States. It's it's a it has let me put it another way. It has been a successful scare tactic for people on the right aimed at particularly older white workers and uh, white workers who have not got don't have a college degree and are working in the kinds of jobs that you get if you don't get a college degree, particularly prior to the Biden economy when those jobs began to expand in manufacturing and construction and elsewhere. Um, 
So the labor movement, I, I agree with Victor completely. The labor movement's position has really changed, and they are much more aggressively embracing immigrant workers, organizing immigrant workers, partnering with worker centers and, and others. Uh, but I don't want to overstate that. Um, is, there, is, is there politics at play here, not just for the labor movement, but more broadly, that makes this issue so difficult for worker power advocates and organized labor. It's, it's, this is, uh, you know, it's a toxic issue politically, and not just in Congress, uh, amongst sort of the public too. And I think when I think about sort of immigration, I, I think that, you know, we talk about these long-term trends of stagnant wages and inequality. And some when there was no other explanation, whether it's, oh, it's you don't have a college degree, that's why your wages are stagnant. And that was kind of the dominant political explanation. Then comes along this alternative story and says, actually, it's immigrants that are the problem. And that's going to be appealing to a, a decent number of people is like, well, they're undercutting my standards and my wages. And and you ha you certainly have a fair amount of people that bought into that. And that's, you know, largely the Trump story of, of what, you know, scapegoat others for what sort of our capitalist economy has done without strong labor unions, with weak minimum wages, with all of these kinds of, of problems. And now we, I feel like the political class has just started to recognize they need an actual solution for workers, what really will deliver for workers. And, uh, but I don't know if it's fast enough or enough to deal with immigration. So it, immigration is not really the problem of why wages are stagnant, not, you know, but it's a very convenient scapegoat. And in, unless and until politicians really deliver higher wages, I think it will always be a, a, a political threat. Yeah, I so I agree with that. And, the you know, the the, the truth of the matter, the for for economists, the discussion in economics and particularly in labor economics is that our suppression of immigration is hurting national economic growth. You know, we only have so many resources to throw at growing our economy and workers are a critically important part of that. And taking immigration out of the mix, we are a country that is at best stagnant from a population perspective and likely shrinking from a population perspective because we're not having enough kids in order to replace ourselves. So we need we're not just a nation of immigrants. We need to be a nation of immigrants in order to be able to grow economically and to drive up wages. So bringing in immigrants not only creates jobs because a large percentage of immigrants end up becoming those vaunted job creators that we hear about so much when tax cuts are being discussed, um, but also that they contribute to growth in our economy. They are highly productive. They tend to be uh, immigrant workers generally on the whole are younger workers. Um, they need to work in order to support themselves. And so they do, and they work very, very, very hard. Um, and so that's very, very good for the economy and therefore good for other workers. That, as I think David's right, and Victor, you're right also, that story has been turned upside down. The idea being that immigrant workers are stealing everybody's jobs and holding down wages in a very, very simple sort of labor supply and demand model. You have too many workers, wages go down. Well, we don't have too many workers, particularly not in this economy. We have too few workers. We need to be able to grow the labor market. Um, and if we could bring workers out of the shadows and they could benefit from the protections of law and the ability to organize more freely, we would be driving up wages even more and therefore helping the economy to grow more. Um, so, Victor, I want to ask, uh, because you've been doing this for a long time, you've seen the good and the bad of the immigration debate. And there has there's been some good. It's hard to remember when there was good, but there's been some good. Uh, are you optimistic about uh, both public policy and economic policy with respect to immigrant workers, including undocumented workers? Well, you know, one thing we need to also talk about is labor protections, because you know, you see every time, like in 2013, the last time we were trying to push for legalization in Congress, it was a big bill that, you know, the Chamber of Commerce, all these uh, uh, employment associations, retailers and all the uh, agriculture and all different associations, they supported comprehensive immigration reform, but they did not want to talk about labor standards and labor enforcement. 
And so that bill only had like very little devoted to that because they look the other way. They, they see it as cheap labor. And that's been the history where immigrant workers in this country. And so it's not just work, you know, giving them legal status. It's making sure they have the labor protection and enforcing those labor protections so they could, they can organize, they can speak out and, you know, against uh, exploitation in the workplace. And, you know, you have, and I think uh, in California, we're focusing a lot on that. We, we have great labor bills that really focuses on enforcement. And in other states like New York is very strong on enforcement. We, to the, you know, people like Julie Su and uh, and others in the Department of Labor, Marty Watch and others, they have been focusing on enforcement. You know, we have to, it's not just about legal status, it's about protections. It, and not just for immigrant workers, for all workers. You know, everybody is afforded the same protection. Um, that what happens is, uh, I think, the economics, you know, we know that immigrant workers is just overwhelming the economic data, how much they contribute to the economy, how much they contribute to not just the economic fabric, but the social fabric. Uh, I think we have to, uh, you know, continue providing uh, uh, like strategies on how to shift this debate. Because I think it, it, it's not just in Congress, but a lot of these red states the issue of immigration becomes so polarized in the debate. People, there's a lot of fear mongering that takes place with this issue. And, you know, people manipulate public opinion on it. But we just have to uh, keep focused on the debate, the contributions. But but we also need to always, always never lose focus of labor protection and enforcement. Because at the end of the day, they're working in these industries. They need to have access to the protection under the laws, but also the enforcement. And I think this is where, uh, you know, it gets very sensitive with the Chamber of Commerce. They want the workforce, but they walk away from the table when you talk about labor enforcement and labor reform. And that's the issue that poses the greatest threat to workers who are already in the United States. Because if you can break the law and and pay people a lot less, that's how workers end up getting replaced. And also you degrade everyone's labor standards. All right, last topic, topic number four. David, this is your topic. Uh, you've written about it this summer. Bidenomics, um, pro, what you, what you describe as pro-worker strings attached um, and the economic and political implications. So why don't you take us into that issue? Well, thanks, Seth. And, uh, you know, you had a lot to do with those pro-worker strings uh, when you were in the, the White House. Uh, what I consider that is sort of when the government's spending money, having uh, policies that flow through with that money to improve standards for workers, everything from prevailing wage to project labor agreements to apprenticeship utilization requirements and the like. And they're, they're key for um, ensuring good jobs come out of, out of public money. Biden spending, you know, the Inflation Reduction Act uh, the chips and the infrastructure have lots of these attached and is among the reasons they're so promising for the kinds of things that will deliver for especially non-college workers, really good jobs. But there's also, to me, a big question. Um, it's not on every little piece of money. And then some of the, for example, the manufacturing jobs don't have these standards attached. So there's uh, that's, I think, a big part of what's behind this UAW strike, for example. And so the big question is, how effective are these Biden uh, policies going to be at both creating good economics and then uh, deliver? And then are people voters going to reward him for that? Uh, and I think it's uh, there's a lot that suggests that it's going the right direction, but there's some real concerns and open open questions for are the electric vehicle manufacturing jobs going to be good jobs and how do we uh, what can we do now to make sure that that happens because the underlying policy wasn't quite good enough. Yeah, well, so I'll, I'll <clears throat> offer a little bit of commentary, uh, self-interested commentary, because I this is where I spent a lot of my time when I was working for President Biden. Um, our strategy uh, our legislatively was what we referred to as the turducken strategy. And that was to stuff the money as much as possible into programs that already had some existing protections like prevailing wage protections or the registered apprenticeship protections or others. And then also to try to include in the legislation 
as much authority as possible for the executive branch to add additional requirements without literally saying you can add additional labor requirements, right? Because that wouldn't have passed. We wouldn't have been able to get that through the Congress. So there were very, very broad grants of authority. And there's also some inherent authority in the executive branch to be able to do this. And then it really became sort of hand-to-hand -hand combat with what are known in the federal government as NOFOs, Notices of Funding Opportunities. It's basically how the government lets the world know that money is available for a particular purpose. And so as much as possible in the grants and in the grant programs and in these notices of funding opportunity, we try to include labor-friendly, worker-friendly, worker-empowering requirements, either as mandates or in strong encouragements. So where there wasn't the prevailing wage, like in the broadband program, we very strongly encouraged it. And we used a little bit of behavioral psychology, behavioral economics in order to do that. Uh, where we could require, and we were legally able to do this, that no money could be spent to oppose a union organizing drive. There had to be neutrality. Their registered apprenticeship programs, the overwhelming majority of workers in the building trades uh, who come out of registered apprenticeships are union members, and that's a very important way that those unions organize their members. Local hire agreements, project labor agreements, a long list of protections that we try to include as broadly as possible across as many departments as we possibly could. Um, so we were, I would describe, you know, and I'm going to confess here that we were moderately successful. Actually, in doing can I that. jump in? I, can I jump in? You. I just, the Biden administration was phenomenally successful. Like, I just wanted you, your work, Seth, and just your colleagues, it's unbelievable how good a job you all did on these sort of standards. Really, you deserve, like, that said, there's still some challenges because the law wasn't quite, uh, you know, Congress did its thing. It didn't let you do all the stuff you wanted to do. It let you, you got to do great, great stuff, though, and that needs to be said. Well, it's nice of you to say that, and uh, I'll get your Venmo account later on. <laughs> thank, thank you very much. But, but I also want to say that it's not, you know, I'm, I'm always happy to blame Congress for everything because I'm an executive branch guy, but it's also there was some resistance in the agencies inside the Biden administration, and there is a tension between imposing strict labor standards and getting the money out quickly to the people who are going to build the projects or clean the water or replace the lead pipes or, uh, uh, you know, install the broadband. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I got into more than my share of fights with more than my share of agencies. I was advocating for more labor standards and they were saying, well, I'm not going to be able to get the money out if you make us do it that way. Also, the, the government is not built for imposing those kinds of standards. We have some labor experts in the labor department, but asking the Department of Energy or the EPA to become labor experts, that's really asking a lot. So my hope is that this will become a learning experience going forward and we can continue to refine it and, and uh, activist scholars like you all will study it and think about it and figure out how do we, how do we regularize this? How do we make it an, a, a strategy in a box for future democratic administrations and maybe the Biden second term if there is one to be able to do this in a more efficient, more effective way? And also, how do we deal with the fact that a lot of employers are just deeply hostile to this strategy? I, 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 we, there was a lot of hostility, and certainly with help from Congress. So, uh, so I'm, I'm glad you wrote about it, David, and I'm glad you shined a light on it. I wrote a little piece about it on the blog. Uh, that even my children didn't read, let me just say. It was that dense. Uh, Victor, let me give you a chance to jump yeah, in here I about mean, you both, trying uh, to use government procurement, yeah. government spending, yeah. these big spending bills to try to help improve yeah. and expand worker power. I mean, you both highlight why we need a second Biden term, because it takes a while. You know, you come in, you you put uh, heads of these administrative agencies, but then to, for it to filter down, it's uh, you know, these are bureaucratic agencies. It takes time to shift that culture. But I think that's why Biden needs another term. I think, you know, if he's reelected, we should have this conversation then three years into his second term and see how, because I think Bidenomics and the approach that you both lay out is it's been happening in administration is the right path and we're already benefiting for it, from it. But 
you know, you're talking about a shift in a lot of these agencies that takes time. And that's why I think in, and my hope is the voters give them another four years because I think we will be seeing increasing benefits from this approach. Yeah. Thanks, Victor. So this was just as fantastic a discussion as I knew it was going to be. So let's quit while we're ahead. Uh, I want to say thank you very much. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you very much to Victor Naro and David Madeline for joining the Power Hour and and for your remarkable work and your contributions to our, our field. And, and let me remind all of you who are watching that you can certainly watch these broadcasts on the Power at Work blog and listen to them on the blog, but you can also listen to them and download them on every imaginable commercial podcast provider, Spotify, Google, Apple Music. They're available there. Just go to Power at Work and you'll find them there. Also, we are available on every, seemingly every uh, social media channel. We are on LinkedIn, Facebook, Threads, Twitter X. Um, I left somebody out. TikTok, Instagram. We're on all those. Power at Work or Power at Work blog. You can find us there. Um, so we will see you on social media. We will see you here on the blog again. We're looking forward to our next Power Hour. Thank you again to David and Victor, a terrific conversation. We'll see you all on the blog again very soon.